Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week I'm honored to have SRA and MK Ultra survivor and overcomer, whistleblower, mother, spiritual coach and warrior, child abuse and trauma advocate and educator, entrepreneur and owner of Positive Shifting and self-directed learner, Kaylin Hartwell, formerly known as Kathy Collins on the show today. There have been a few prolific survivors who have been speaking out for many years and who have persisted in speaking out despite what opposes them. And Kaylin is one to add to the list alongside other courageous women that have been on this show like Spolly, Cheryl Beck and Penny L.A. Shepard who have been paving the way for many years for survivors and victims to have a voice. I was recently introduced to Kaylin's story and felt so deeply in my heart that I needed to reach out and see if she'd come on the podcast and was so honored when she said yes. I find her and her life so inspiring because although she's been through horrific things that were meant to break her and that the majority of people can't fathom, she chooses to focus on the redemption side of her story and now devotes her time to helping other people turn their own pain and trauma into power and purpose. With the subject of trauma being something every single person on the planet experiences in different degrees and kinds, it's really shocking how little we truly know about this subject matter and how even doctors of psychiatry are not taught things like dissociative identity disorder or satanic ritual abuse. Kaylin truly bridges the gap in helping everyone from survivors of MK Ultra to therapists to helping those of us who are dealing with the everyday traumas and stresses associated with being a human being understand the complexities of how trauma is layered throughout the body and how we go about healing from these new understandings. One of the things I fell in love with about Kaylin is how centered she is on providing messages of hope to survivors. After all she's overcome, it's nothing short of a miracle from God that she is here with us today and that she can serve as a living testament as of what is possible with the right knowledge, understanding, and action in regards to surviving and thriving after trauma. When she speaks, she is standing up for every victim and survivor and helping society as a whole understand the unthinkable in a palatable way. I know if you are here listening today that you're going to leave with so many takeaways, and this may be an episode you may want to listen to more than once. I'm incredibly honored to bring to you today, woman of God, voice for the voiceless, healer, educator, child advocate, trauma educator, and absolute inspiration, Kaylin Hartwell. Kaylin, thank you so much for being here with me today. Well, thank you. Oh my gosh. I, I need a drum for that drum roll. That was just... <laughs> <laughs> I'm so you're here. Thank you so much. You're so gracious. And I'm so uh, blessed to be on this, uh, this podcast with you. And uh, I want to thank you very much for doing what you do. Um, you do with such a, such a, an open and pure heart. And that is what is important. So uh, Anyway, so where do I start? Yes, yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I'm just excited to be here talking to you. So uh, it's it's wonderful to be able to share this. It's an honor to have you here. Like I said, you know, I when I read these stories and see what people like you have overcome, like most people in society, they look at celebrities like, oh my gosh, and I look at you guys like that. I'm like, gosh, we have so much to learn about what we're truly capable of as humans, what, what can happen on the other side of healing our inner child if we're an adult and the importance of you know 
children and how to raise them and just bringing awareness in general to these things that happen, whether or not we like to hear about them, they do happen, you know, and all of us know people, we might be that person that has experienced extreme trauma and we need to really start as a society understanding this and how to approach it, how to recognize it, how to heal from it, you know, and how to be there for people who have gone through it. So I'm really grateful that you've been, you know, talking about this side of it and trying to educate people. Cause like I said, you know, even in psychiatry, a lot of doctors who are, you know, they go to school for four to eight, 10 years, they don't learn about some of these things. And so, you know, we're misdiagnosing people. There's people walking around that just feel so helpless. And it's really nice to, you know, listen to somebody like you that, some people can listen to and say, she understands, you know, and oh my gosh, look at what she's done with her life. She has kids. She has a, you know, she has a thriving business. Like I can do that too, if she can. So I just can't thank you enough for everything that you're doing. And for people who haven't heard of you, I'd love for you to maybe just give us a little bit of background on your story and maybe at the Kathy Collins side that people might know you as and and just go into maybe a little bit of your past and kind of what got you here today to where you're at now. Yeah, well, it's, it is like having, uh, as we were talking earlier uh, off camera, you know, I feel like I just started a new life. And um, my uh, life for me as Kathy Collins, I was born Kathleen Aaron Collins. That was my, my dad was very proud of our Irish heritage. And um, I had a different notion, like, you know, other people on your show have, have told that, you know, because of the suppressed memories, um, I thought I had one life and I was aware of some of the abuses, but it was mixed up because I, I, was, I knew that there were terrible things that happened in my family. Um, but I still painted this picture of, oh, my family is perfect. And um, the memories didn't start coming out. Well, a memory started to emerge at age 27 when my oldest daughter was one year old. And I dreamt that my husband had raped her. I got up. And I told this to my husband, my then husband, about this dream. And he was so upset and he screamed at me. He said, don't you ever, ever, ever say anything like that to me again. And I was so ashamed. And I thought, I don't watch anything like this on TV. Where did this come from? So what I did is I shut it down like full force. And almost the very next day, I came down with severe TMJ, temporal mandibular joint syndrome, extreme pain. So I'm going to professionals to take care of the TMJ. They think it's because of a you know injured hip. You know they're looking at structural things. There was nothing structural wrong with my jaw. I had this TMJ for 17 full years. That meant that during the entire childhood of all my three children, they didn't have a mom who was present because I was in so much pain. And three years later, I, I contemplated suicide, which might've been the programming because it was very strong for three months. Every day I was obsessed with this, wanting to take my life. But I go, oh, what am I, my kids, I need to find it. I need to find a mom for them, but I couldn't go anywhere. I was a vegetable. Here, age 30, I was a total vegetable because my, I had shut down. And um, I was married to a personality type that was um, perfect because you've got a real codependent is going to go with a narcissist. So I had to have that compliment. It's like a mathematical formula. People say, oh, it's not fair, but it's, it's like, is two plus two equaling four fair? You know, that's just, it's just a mathematical formula in our reality. Uh, it's energetic. And also that experience being married to this person 
was to teach me a really solid lesson that I could pass on to other people. And it was to teach me the value of my self-sovereignty. As a codependent, I gave myself away, gave myself away to the point where years later, my kids thought I was dying of cancer. And I wasn't, but I was near, I could feel the, um, what do you call it? I could feel the connection to life was very tenuous. It was just like on strings. That's what it felt like. So how did I end up with this type of personality is I was uh, born into this trauma. It didn't, uh, I was born in 1957 in Santa Rosa, California, which is, was one of the major MK Ultra centers for Project Monarch, according to Kathy O'Brien. Lovely woman, by the way. I, I, I can't say enough about how much she has done to educate people. And so a cyber, when I finally realized what all the constellation of things that happened to me, I, I did email her and Mark. And I was scared because I thought, well, maybe they're trying to, uh, maybe it's, it's a setup and they're trying to find me. So there was this like, no, but I need to reach out. I need to reach out. So I did reach out. And within 24 hours, I got this lovely email back. And it was just, wow, to get this email back that was so compassionate. And uh, it, it, it just still resonates with me today. So this is something that people can take away with them is you don't know how such a simple act can really help somebody and make them feel safe or safer, right? And not feel like, you know, because I thought I was going crazy. There was nobody I could talk to. Right now, it's really cool that there are people like you are talking, we're talking about it in public space. Um, so the reality of my, uh, my past came out when I was coming out of the TMJ 17 years later, I came down with severe chemical sensitivity. Um, I was allergic to everything I was eating. Uh, I could only wear cotton. I couldn't get near anybody who had washed their clothes with Thai detergent. I mean, I was extra, I couldn't go into the grocery store. It just smelled like chemicals. I couldn't take my kids clothes shopping because of the formaldehyde in the, in the clothes. So I was where I was near death and I go, there's no place on this planet I can, I can live. And so I asked um, a neighbor who seemed to be well-connected I said, do you know where I can go? And she said, well, contact Bastyr University. I was in, up in Washington State at the time. And it's the university that trains naturopaths. And so I called them. I said, can you give me a recommendation? Because this is my situation. They said, well, we can't. It's a policy. And I understand that. But I said, I am near death. I have to know. Um, and so the person said, well, don't tell anybody. <laughs> But they gave me Dr. Crinian's name and I called him up and I went to him immediately. He started doing the detoxing, but he had some very curious questions on his questionnaire. The reason I'm bringing this up is because people who are not aware of things, their clues start coming into their awareness when they're ready. So I'm filling out the questionnaire and said, Has you, have you ever been sexually abused? And I thought, kind of ridiculous question. We're talking about chemical sensitivity. What does that have to do with sexual abuse? Well, apparently it had everything to do with it. So I didn't know. And he could see it right there. He could see it when he saw all my symptoms. He knew my story. He didn't know that about the SRA, right? But he knew about the sexual abuse. And sexual abuse alone is enough to really debilitate a person. And he said, you know, you were exposed. Now he couldn't tell me directly because that would be too shocking. The shock, I wasn't ready for that shock of discovery because that would have taken me out of 
totally, it would have bumped me totally out of healing. So please therapists, if you see somebody across from you and you have, you know, by their symptoms, this is what has happened to them. Don't tell them because that's exactly what happened to my brother. And he went crazy. He, he had to go to 18 therapists after that because he was told too soon what oh happened. To him. Gosh. Yes, but this is because therapists were not educated. We're not educated, but I was so blessed to be with people who are very, very gentle and tender around this subject. And so he asked me to, uh, he said, you know, there's this book you might want to read. Uh, it's codependent no more. You want it? It's up on the shelf over there. And so I reached up to get it. And so I could look at it and I couldn't hear anything else he said after that, because I was so uh, worried about how I was going to get the book back up on the shelf without interrupting the conversation. So I couldn't hear anything he had to say. I, that's how codependent I was. I was so trained to be so in tune with the other person's needs. I was in tune to, you know, my trainers, my dad, whatever. I was there to just serve them. And I didn't know how to undo, I didn't know that this was the mechanism I had going on. So I finally found a break and I put it up there. And I wish I knew what he said because he was so full of wonderful knowledge. But I did get the I did get the book and I read it. <clears throat> and as I'm reading it, I'm going, oh my gosh, there's stuff in here that I think my brother would relate to. And now I was pretty estranged from my siblings. This is very typical. I mean, we didn't outright fight, but we weren't, I, I was just on the periphery. I didn't interact with them a lot. And of course I was far away. So I called him and he said, all he said was, well, you know what happened with our father? And then this, sensation came over my body and Dr. Crinian had taught me, he said, now listen, when your mind thinks something and your body tells you something different, your body is telling you the truth. So I had this body reaction. My mind is saying, okay, and, and that's all he said, you know what our father did. So obviously my mind jumped there, but I wasn't going to look but I had this full body reaction and I can't remember the rest of the conversation, but after getting off the phone for a whole week, I did this ping pong. No, can't be true. My dad, no, he, he no, 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 no. But then my body would say, oh, this is awful. And I had this terrible pain all over, like every cell in my body was screaming. So by the end of the week uh, of that process, then I realized that that was true. So that led me to the piece where I could start healing just the piece with my father and the sexual abuse. The other thing Dr. Crinian taught me was your digestive system doesn't work. You have your overload with toxins because you experienced trauma while your systems were being for formed and your digestive system never got to fully form. So that's why I was so overloaded with toxins, even though I wasn't drinking or smoking or, you know, I was, I was eating a pretty clean, I was having a pretty clean lifestyle. According to my knowledge back then, I didn't know about organic back then, but, you know, as clean as it could be. So what happened was that I kept, you know, I kept investigating, doing, you know, journaling, and uh, then I became part of, I had this over, I lost my, I, I had to quit my job because I couldn't function. I had severe fibromyalgia. Nobody could touch me. I mean, we're talking extreme pain in every cell of my body on top of the, the TMJ. So I go to this pain study in, um, oh, back up. I went to take my youngest daughter to get her braces and the prosthodontist, I thought, okay, I need a mouthpiece uh, because I wear a night guard at night. So why not have him check me out? 
so I went to have him check me out and he said, oh, um, you don't have anything structurally wrong with your jaw. And he said, I know somebody who can help you though. So he sent me to Dr. Love, don't you love that name, at um, the Pain Study uh, Institute Clinic at University of Washington in Seattle. Now that meant I had to drive and I was really dissociative. So it was really difficult for me to do this. But I got a stipend uh, for going there and they would um, do all these tests. But then I went in this one time for him to, for Dr. Love to check my mouth. And um, he had a couple of students there and he says, is it okay if the students you know, watch and learn? And um, I said, okay. So he did this experiment where he opened my mouth. He says, now you just relax and let me open your mouth. And so he did and then they measured how wide my mouth would open. He says, now open your mouth on your own. Let's see how wide you can open it. And they would measure it. And they did this three times. Consistently, when I opened my mouth, myself, it was 10 millimeters wider than when he opened it. So then he turned to the students. He said, yes, and this is indicative of sexual abuse. Oh, my whole body is just like... Oh, I was flooded. I felt my, my face turning red. And because, you know, we're in a learning institution, it's all about learning. I'm not the client, you know, so it's just like, I, I'm feeling it now again, just reliving that experience. So oh I'm sharing this because when we, we suppress the, the information for so long and so hard, it can produce these effects. I was able to get over the TMJ in three weeks after learning that piece of information. So it was completely psychosomatic. And all these dentists over all these years were drilling on my teeth and doing all kinds of fancy stuff because they have no clue. We're not they have about. no clue, except for this guy and the, the prosthodontist that I went to. So, as you pointed out, we have gaps. We have big gaps in our medical establishment that people who are front in the front lines who ought to be able to like, oh, wait a minute, she has nothing wrong with her jaw. Why is she having all this pain? They were even talking about giving me surgery, but it would have cut off the nerves to my mouth and I wouldn't have been able to, to I wouldn't have been able to smile. Oh my gosh. So I'm very lucky that uh, we didn't do that. Uh, so. That's that was the very beginning of that. So then I went on this journey of healing all and around my memories father. come like right away after that, or was well, it what happened is I would have memories of being underneath the house and these creatures chasing me under the house. And I would tell Dr. Crane, I go, This is what's happening. I feel like I mean, it's icky, icky feelings. And it was because my mind, he said, your mind is protecting you. You can't, you can't see what actually happened. You can just, just get hints. You're under the house. The house represents you. That means you're in the subconscious. You just can't break out of the subconscious because it was so horrifying to you. So um, he performed NAET on me. I can't remember what that acronym stands for, but it's the first energy healing that I uh, I received. And of course, we had to go off to some clandestine place because, oh, well, you know, a naturopath is not supposed to be doing energy work. And then he released, you know, certain points that he said, well, your biggest issue is fear of abandonment, which is basically almost everybody's, you know, but it was huge for me. Um, so this set me on this journey of healing around my father. I just did lots of work on that. I could never get solid memories of it, but it was just like notions, notions. And um, so we'll fast forward a few more years. I moved to Paris because my husband gets, the, he gets transferred to Paris for a couple of years. 
and um, and my two younger kids got to go to the American School of Paris, and it was cool that I already spoke French, so oh. I go, wow, thank that's a save, uh, but let's see how the universe, how it all gets set up like this. If we'd gone to Germany, I couldn't have spoken, and I was dissociative, so it was really, you know, it was really, um, it was really hard to just do anything, but I go, okay, I can function, I know French, and um, so my brother comes over to visit. They the saying goes, when you move to Paris, everybody visits you. You find <laughs> so that's what happens. <laughs> Came all the way to see me there. Wasn't going to come up to Washington, but oh, to Paris. From Paris. Yeah. So he came. Now this is the one where uh, we were talking earlier about half truths, right? Discerning whether something is a full truth or half truth. So he comes to visit and I'm telling, I said, I'm feeling better. I think I, I got over stuff. I'm feeling more energy. And I, I, that summer I was able to function and it was really cool. And he said, well, there's more. Are you ready? I go, hey, I want to heal. Just, just tell me, just tell me. Okay. Well, we were prostituted and used in satanic rituals. Again, the whole body reaction again. But he said two things in that sentence. So I could believe being prostituted because I remembered being put in suitcases and potato bags. We're talking from two years old. I was taken out and used by both men and women. So I remember being put in the trunk of the car. Um, and then it turned out, it. it it took me several years later to figure out the definitive moment when I quit my job, my last job, because I lost my teaching credential status because we just moved over the border. And so I was working as a teacher's assistant for the business school and I was in the candy store and I was stocking candy. And, um, and then I had this notion I had to go answer the phone. I'll remember, I'll, I'll get back to my brother in a minute. I went over to the phone and I saw it was off the hook. And I lifted it up and I go, oh, a vendor uh, with an order. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So I went over to the business teacher. I said, did you know there, the, there was somebody on the phone? She goes, yes, I came in and I had this whole conversation with you to tell you about it. And I said, if we were in a court of law, I would swear that I don't remember you coming and talking to me. So I had total missing time total missing time from an entire experience. So I thought, oh my gosh, what else am I not remembering? You know, I hear I had somebody to verify what happened and the evidence was there. The phone was off the hook. Years later, it took years later to figure out what happened. Stocking the shelves with candy triggered the memory of my dad luring me to the car with candy. So you see how the most benign thing with this kind of background, the most benign thing like M&Ms <laughs> um, could make you just go, and, and I went totally, I would go possum. They say fight, flight, I did the freeze. That was my go-to mechanism was freeze. So get back to my brother, and he had these two things in the sentence. So I thought, okay, I can, but oh, they say tannic rituals. He's, you know, my brother, I think he's a little bit, you know, I don't think he's really got it. Yeah, I, but I'm not going to say that I love him. I'm not going to say we, we've been through this stuff. And so I didn't say anything to him, but privately I thought, uh-uh, this is, you know, but then I started to have some interesting experiences. My, my husband's Iranian. We went to Iran and I came back and I came back with a curse from somebody who was jealous in the family. So I went to a body attack practitioner who removed the curse oh. and I'm going, okay, this is really weird. I mean, uh, cause I was getting all these symptoms. I'm very uh, sensitive. So I thought, okay, I didn't see how that was related to anything. Uh, all that's related to is that I'm very sensitive. And so we moved to Connecticut after that. My husband's on a business trip. 
And as I'm starting to fall asleep, there's this entity that comes from 20 feet away. Now the room is only 10 by 10, but this entity, how do I know? It came from 20 feet away and its face was within six inches of my nose and I knew it wanted my soul. And I thought, oh my gosh, I jumped out of bed. I go, okay, that wasn't my imagination. That wasn't, I'm turning on all the lights and I am, I'm freaked out, totally freaked out. And I go, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, my brother, he's right, he's right, he's right. <laughs> and that was the experience I had to have. So I'm going, oh, he's on the West Coast. I can't talk to him yet. So I'm waiting. I couldn't sleep all night. Um, so I wait until the morning to, to call him. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that happened to me for seven years. I had to deal with that. I go, what? He goes, yeah, portals were opened while we were going through these things. So this was like, I'm going, okay, I need a healing team. I need to be with people who understand this. So that's when I made the intention that, okay, I need a healing team. I, I'm Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> and I need all the king's horses and all the king's men because this is just, I have no idea you know, what to do. But in the meantime, I'm learning to do body talk, which is an energy healing system. And I'm trying to help my kids overcome, you know, the issues of our family, because, you know, I married somebody who was like my father. Now, not as bad, right? Where nothing physical or sexual happened to my kids, but, you know, the emotional trauma happened. And um, so we get back to Washington. And uh, then I find out I need to divorce because I realized that, um, that uh, my husband was with other people. Oh, <laughs> and I could hear him on the phone. And, and in the meantime, he was, you know, he was telling me, well, if you can't, if you can't keep up with paying the bills, then we're going to have to just sell the house. You know, and here I'm, I'm on disability and I'm really scared. And, and so any kind of threat, it was really easy to threaten me because I was so trained. Fast forward today, this man is absolutely scared of me. I love you too. You are so powerful and just so resilient. I know. Just because I, I stood up to it, you know, I got Your narcissist the worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, what it was is the angels. I believe that angels came and brought me evidence. And I said, no, 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 this can't. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't finish the thing about the half truths. When my, my brother presented two things in one sentence, I thought that was a half truth. That one happened to be a whole truth. So see, this is where half truth can get sticky. Um, so I wanted to button that topic up. So, so anyway, angels were showing me you know, this is what's going on. And you know, you're in a bad situation and you got to do something about this. And my daughter's about to get married. And I'm going, why does this all have to come out before marriage? <laughs> so I went through the whole marriage, like thinking I was going to either throw up or cry at any minute. So I kept, you know, hiding because I'm going, I got a divorce. I got a divorce. And I, I got to do it on the slide because he, he's going to deny everything, whatever. So so that set me on this course of, of doing this wonderful divorce, uh, which in and of itself was a huge um, event. Uh, and it went on for three years because you don't threaten a narcissist with divorce. I found out, I didn't know what a narcissist was until, you know, I started going, to, then I started, okay, hey, I'm going into debt, paying all these lawyers. I'm going to get all the healers. And so it turned out that all the people I needed showed up. I went to this woman. She was a, a family, family therapist or something like that, that I had been referred to earlier because um, I went to this cranial sacral therapist thought, you know, things aren't going too right in your situation. Maybe you want to, but I, I didn't want to face that. I didn't want to face that. So I go to her finally, and then I go, you know what? I don't care what she thinks. I'm going to blurt everything out. I told her about the SRA. I told her about, you know, getting, um, you know, uh, being prostituted. I told her about the sexual abuse. 
And here I was ready for her to just throw me out the door. And she goes, oh, I know just what you need. You need a soul retrieval. And I just met the person that can help you. <laughs> and I'm, so I was like, what? I was you know, prepared for this you know, really awful reaction. So then she sent me to this guy, this medium. Uh, and so then I started uh, healing with him. And uh, because he can see your guides, it's like you lay there and he's talking to these invisible beings, whatever. So I, I go to set up my first appointment. And this is something for your audience to know if you're dealing with somebody with, uh, who's had satanic ritual abuse. He said, now there might be some voices in your head that are gonna tell you that I'm evil or that you couldn't, you shouldn't come to see me, or your car might not start, or whatever. There might be something that might try to prevent you from coming. You need to resist that and push through it. Well, I've got a real stubborn streak in me, so that <laughs> it served me well. I go, okay, I'm going to anchor in, and sure enough, you know, the fears, no, I shouldn't go. You shouldn't. Oh, yes, yes, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. So I went and uh, my first appointment lasted eight hours, which was unusual. And um, he said, oh my gosh, I've never seen anybody release so much, excuse my French, the S-H-T, <laughs> uh, in one session. And, um, and so people, healers like that work with, um, in the world of spirit, language is through images and animals and things like that. So it's not always with words. And symbols, lots of symbols. Right, right. And so he's trying to tell me about all these fantastic things, Rick, but what he does is he puts the protective, you know, the, 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 the Christed light brings it in, makes everything protected, whatever. He goes to open up the energy. It was booby trapped. It sent him onto his knees. And he said, if he didn't think quickly enough, he would have died. Um, but he was able to, he goes, oh my gosh, I should have, but he'd never dealt with somebody like me before. He'd never dealt with satanic ritual abuse. And then later, now I don't know how far down the rabbit hole we could go, but there were a lot of fantastic things that happened there. So in my journey, uh, discovering all, I went through the shock of discovery for two and a half years of just discovering all these really gnarly things. And, um, but I couldn't make it out. I can't remember how far into that, those two and a half years, I think it was like maybe six months. I was calling uh, to make the appointment with him. I, I can't understand why would somebody go have all these things happen to them, you would think that one of these things would be enough. And she said, well, haven't you heard of MK Ultra? Like everybody knew about it. <laughs> and I go, no. And she said, and so she's the one who directed me to listen to Kathy O'Brien. So then I started listening to that. And then that's when I started. Now I'm going through this divorce at the same time I'm going through all of these discoveries. So I'm feeling like, how am I going to be able to hold this all together? So I'm generating a lot of fear. I mean, I was experiencing, re-experiencing terror. Terror can be like your cells just exploding. It can also come as your blood just turning cold like ice. So I go, oh, wow, I, get, I know all about fear and terror. Isn't how wonderful is that? <laughs> oh my gosh and so you know you have to have some comic relief along the way or else you're gonna you know you're gonna give up so i'm having all all this creepy stuff is happening in the house and um we get a cat i'm there just with my youngest daughter now because the other two are off in college during this divorce the divorce era so we get a cat because we think, okay, if the cat's bumping around, we'll go, oh, there's a noise. Oh, it must be the cat. <laughs> so, so we're sitting at the kitchen counter and 
we're both feeling like this whole like coming up our back and we can both feel and how did we know the other one is feeling the same thing this is this is the mystery of how we're all connected right so we look at each other didn't have to say anything so we go to look back at the cat because we're thinking we're both thinking that okay if the cat's chill it's fine we look back at the cat and her fur is <laughs> And I hear this knocking in the wall, really loud knocking. And I'm scared half out of my wits. So I call the next morning. I call the medium. I say, what's going on? And he goes, that was you. You created elementals with your thinking. You so you've got to stop those fear thoughts. And I'm going, yeah, I remember reading years earlier in the Hindu tradition, they're talking about how thoughts were things. Oh my gosh, I was living that reality. He goes, you need to go into non-fear. So my whole education with this guy was as we're going and discovering things and that, and then I go, went to another therapist who's bringing up the memories and what they're, they're back and forth. They were working in tandem with each other. I would go to her, I would journal. I got this wonderful uh, dream interpretation book um, by Tony Crisp. Oh, amazing. I got it for a dollar at a book sale. And so I was interpreting my dreams and I'd go to the therapist and she says, where are you getting this information? I said, well, this book, I only spent a dollar for it. She goes, that is, I've been doing this for 20 years. This is the, these are the best interpretations. So I, I was getting really into digging deeper. I finally got out of the basement of the house and I was getting into the house and the house represents your, your body and going into the different rooms and so forth and having experiences in that. But then sometimes they were actual like memories. And then I would um, remember people doing things like I felt so guilty because I knew they were doing stuff to my brother who's five years younger. But the way it came up in the dream is there were these big bears and they were eating and, and then I was going, oh, I can't save them from the bears because I couldn't go there to the literal. But then when I woke up, I go, oh, I know what that was representing. So when people have these, if, if the trauma is too great and they're highly sensitive. So me being very sensitive, that means that all the torture I went through was magnified. Oh, yeah. More than the average, you know, an average person. So I go to the, the therapist and, uh, oh, I was going to cranial sacral therapy at the same, not cranial sacral, visceral manipulation. The, they work with the viscera. I don't know if you've heard, but it's very, very gentle, very. And so he's working on me one day and he, he asked me, oh, were you involved in any rituals by any chance? And I said, well, yeah, uh, I was. And at this time, I knew, right? I was in the knowing. And, and I said, yeah, I was uh, used in satanic ritual abuse. He goes, oh, because I see you laying on a slab with your hands and feet tied. So that's all I needed. I go, okay. So I took that, I go, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna process this on my own. So I went to the therapist, she did e EMDR and she did it with a selenite stone, which doesn't, if you know about selenite, it doesn't absorb any negative energies. Oh, yeah, I have one. <laughs> um, they're just cool looking, by the way. Uh, so I go in there and I told her about this and she goes, OK, let's let's do this. Let's go into there. So we go into the memory. Now, how this felt like it was when I was five years, old. it felt like. Did you ever watch the movie The Matrix? Yeah. You know, when Neo gets sucked down that tube. That's what it felt like. 
I felt like this memory was physically sucking me in down this tube to this place. And there I saw myself as a five-year-old. I was naked, uh, tied down to this stone altar, which was exactly the same altar, by the way, that they put in the opening scene of Sherlock Holmes, the movie. What? The exact, I go, when I saw that movie, I go, where, how do they know what that's supposed to look like? How do they know? Anyway, so, but then I'm standing outside of myself and I'm wearing clothes and I'm my five-year-old self. And there's this beautiful woman standing next to me in this gossamer gown. Oh, it just makes me want to cry. She's so beautiful, so gracious. And, but I'm looking down at the child there on there. And then I see the three hooded figures. I can't see their faces. And they're saying, well, we can't break her. We can't break her. But when I saw myself, I saw two of me. I saw my head, one head going this direction and the other head going that. So there, was, there were two of me, one superimposed on top of the other. And one was going one direction. The other one was going the other. So I thought, that's really weird. So she helped me through the experience. It was really, I was so grateful. There was somebody there. And I was thinking, man, this woman isn't running out of the room yet, you know? <laughs> and um, so we got through that. I calmed down. It was really nice to release that. And so then we knew I was ripe to go see the medium and have the energy removed. So th this is how it works. They can't release the, the the healer can't take that energy from you until you've learned the lesson until you got it okay so i learned uh, well this was i learned what happened and i got it at, and there's a lot of stuff that's not at the cognitive level so but anyway i go in to him and i said i saw two of me and he said, oh, you saw two of you because one of you, you were separating whenever a, a, a child or anybody goes through trauma, a piece of their soul leaves. And you were watching a piece of your soul leave your body. I said, why is that? They said, that's to preserve innocence. So by me going through that, reliving it and understanding, and by the way, the woman who was standing next to me was my higher self. So, um, so it, it was just, it was, it was a very beautiful, very beautiful scene. So he was able to do the soul retrieval where not only was I able to retrieve my soul, you don't do your entire soul, right? A piece of your soul. So we were able to bring back that piece of my soul from that incident and then he said, and then he brought in all the pieces from my soul, from all the past life, because I'd been tortured every single lifetime up to this one. I, I mean, that's the kind of soul I've got, I guess. I don't know. But anyway, he said it was like a light. He said, I wish you could see it. All the lights are coming in. And he's saying, yeah, and he's, he's having a wondrous time. And I'm feeling really good. I go, oh, wow, this is so cool. I get to be whole again. Well, that was just... The beginning because there was so much I had to do to become whole um, but that's it's it's just an amazing amazing thing to happen to be able oh he said that um yes this can only happen because the energies of course this was in 2007 or 8 so the energies finally opened up for us to be able to do this. This was not possible until now. So this is a message of hope to everybody. And since then, the healing energies have been opening up and opening up and, and the consciousness of everybody going through their traumas. I know that COVID was, is, was not fun. Like it wasn't fun for me to go through the divorce and everything, but you know, I learned, I go, wow, I cannot be a victim. I have to stand up for myself. Nobody's going to stand up for me. I'll go back to the matrix. Uh, uh, again, I love this scene. It's one of my favorite movies. <laughs> the scene where 
Neo is uh, going to rescue Morpheus. Morpheus is tied to the chair and he can barely just, uh, he can just barely uh, function. That's a really good analogy for us because Neo, the one, could save him only when Morpheus tried to save himself. He had to get up out of the chair and meet him halfway. Beautiful metaphor, beautiful metaphor. And so this is where we have to, you know, as individuals, no matter what we've gone through and everybody's gone through stuff recently, everybody. And if you haven't personally know somebody and that affects you, and to just know that this is part of our actually, you know, we're growing up, we're growing out of it. You know, it's, uh, you know, a child when they're growing, how they'll have growing pains, you know, so we're having growing pains. I've gone off on tangents, so please uh, help me. <laughs> oh my gosh, all that was so valuable. No, thank you. Okay, because I want to make sure I'm not just rambling on and not giving, I want to be giving uh, useful information uh, that will empower people because there, there was so much I learned along the way, so much because I was, there wasn't a day that didn't pass that I wasn't focused on healing. Because I so badly, my entire adult life, I was in utter pain. And, um, you know, I've come recently, I was able to um, let go of the PTSD. And the last piece of that was nutritional. Because uh, what the, with the fires here in California, uh, three, was it three and a half years ago, I, was, I came down with dementia because of the toxins in the air, you know, the, when you have med heavy metals in the brain is what causes dementia. And I knew that and I'm going, oh my gosh, I need a detox system. I'm not around healers here um, who can help me. I've got to do this on my own. And so that's when I came upon medical medium and I started using his protocols for detoxification. I was able to reverse the dementia in three months oh my gosh in three months and the bonus was my ptsd fully lifted because and then i read in his books i go oh the neurotoxins in the brain don't let you completely heal from the ptsd i did all the spiritual and emotional work but i wasn't able to you know I, things would still like you know uh startle me and i go whoa and oh I don't have photophobia anymore. I thought I was just born with photophobia. And photophobia is when lights hurt your eyes. You know, any overhead light would just, you know, I was always, the, the house was always dark because the lights would hurt my eyes. The sun would hurt my eyes. I go, oh, the sun is, oh, and I don't have acid reflux anymore. So it was, you know, when you do the holistic thing. So here's another message is that we've got to address We've got to address our well-being at every level of our beingness, our nutrition, our thinking, our beliefs. And we don't have enough time to go into that, into the belief thing, but the beliefs are, this time, uh, the beliefs are the drivers of our, you know, if you've listened to Bruce Lipton and all of those people, they definitely are the drivers and I'll, so I'll give an example of this one. So you, I, I tell people to become like a Sherlock Holmes uh, when you have curious things going on in your life and they're unexplainable, uh, try to find out, well, what is, the, what is going on in my subconscious that's driving this? And um, this is before the divorce area, era. And this is when I was sick on the couch a lot. And my oldest daughter was in high school she invited me to go to this really cool, you know, um, woo woo bookstore in Seattle. And so we were going to go there and look at the tarot cards and fun stuff and, and, um, and then go out for a hamburger. So we went out together. I had a lovely time. I was going, wow, I'm having such a great time. This is wonderful. Oh, and we get home, not only like, like 10 minutes after getting home, I get this immense pain all over my body and I have to go to the couch and I'm laying down on the couch and I'm going, wait a minute. 
I wasn't exposed to any toxins. I was going through my checklist. I had a wonderful time. Oh my gosh, I got to be with my, you know, with my teenage daughter who wouldn't want that, you know? We went, there was, there were no negatives. I go, how is it that I am just so sick? And then I lay there and I call it tuning in. That's some people call it praying, opening up, meditating. Then the information came in. Oh, I had the belief that it was forbidden to have fun. So I automatically punished myself with physical pain. The brain will just, it's like, okay, I'm on to you. So I use the Eckhart Tolle method where you be the watcher. And I invite anybody who hasn't read his stuff, go read his stuff. Amazing. So I read him for, he was, he was my guru for three full years <laughs> every day, just listening to him. And um, so I thought, okay, the next time this happens, I'm going to catch it. And so it only happened just a few more times. And each time I didn't get as sick and it didn't last as long. So I was able to undo, but I had to shed the light of knowledge onto that belief. We have these beliefs that we really were totally unaware of. And I didn't think when I went to the pain study, they had me go through cognitive therapy. I don't know if you've heard of that, right? So it's very left brain, you write down what your thoughts are, whatever. And they had me have this little timer that would go off and I had to write down whatever was in my mind when the timer went off. I was so shocked because I thought I was a positive thinker because I was always listening to Zig Ziglar and all these positive thinking people, Brian Tracy, Tony Robbins, you name it, right? And I couldn't believe the thoughts I was, I was embarrassed in front of myself. So that's another exercise that I'd invite everybody to go through, to go out and clean out that library, because guess what? It is, uh, it can create disease or it can create problems in relationships, problems with money, you name it. It's gonna, it's gonna pop up as a problem somewhere because why? Because then the problem is just the messenger. Hey, you see this? You see this? This is not the way we're meant to be. We're meant to be in balance. We're meant to be in harmony. But um, coming out of this era that we, we learned through opposites, we learned love by experiencing hatred. We learn loyalty by experiencing betrayal et cetera, et cetera. We're letting go of that. The new way is coming and the new way of teaching. We don't teach so much at the way like instructing, we teach by example, being an example. And then people will say, oh, and that's what happened to Eckhart Tolle. You know, he just, he was this example of total bliss. And people said, well, how did you do that? He goes. I don't know. I guess I got to go figure this out. So then he started studying so he could have words for it. And, um, and so he's in another, another amazing uh, uh, guide. For, there's so many beautiful souls out there giving us the information for when we're ready for it. The teacher arrives when the student is ready. And um, so that's where we're at. You know, we it will come because I mean, I wasn't ready. People, there were clues about my past. There were clues about my marriage. All the, you know, when I started reading the books, I'm going, oh my God, oh my God, it was right there. It was right there. Oh my God, it was right in front of my nose. But it's so unconscious, you know? And one of the things that I love that, that you talk about is, you know, two things, the, how you talk about serotonin and how, people are chasing that unconsciously and looking for chaos in their life, chaotic relationships, and don't realize that it's serving a human need that they can replace that habit and that belief with something else. But they're so tied up in unconsciously, you know, seeking it in relationships or these patterns 
you know, and not understanding the physiology of why they keep making those same choices over and over again. You know, so many of us get caught in that. Even people, you know, I've done that in my life where I've repeated, you know, the same patterns and dated the same people, even though in the beginning, I'm like, oh, this person's so different. And then, you know, a year down the road, it's like, wait a minute, how did I end up in this exact same spot? You know, do you have Mm -hmm. anything to contribute to that? I love how you talk about the serotonin aspect and how oh, yes yeah well the patterns it's the we have these vibrational patterns so for me because i had all this trauma and the type of trauma i had i attracted all kinds of bizarre weird things and people but at the same time okay i i have to give the message this is a little sidebar that you know talk about all these awful things but along the way there were these I was being protected when I was two years old or going through this kind of thing, the child will try to annihilate itself instinctively. So I kept trying to kill myself. And my poor mother was trying to, she goes, if you could just stay alive till you're five, we'd get you to kindergarten. <laughs> um, so, but I, we were, the family went to uh, visit uh, my aunt in Petaluma who lived on this really steep hill. And uh, back then, the brakes were this like a little stick that you would just pop, and then it would oh, it would release the brake. My older sister got in to to play in there. You know, she wouldn't let me have a turn because I was the younger sister, right? So I got to have my turn when she was out of the car. I'm in there, two and a half years old. Pop! The car starts rolling down the steepest hill in. Petaluma going across the busiest road. And I'm, I remember going, because I was steering like this, I was going up one side, walked out. So I slowed it down a little bit. I went across the intersection without hitting a car, jumped the curb, uh, went head on into a tree, totaled my dad's, it wasn't his car, it was his company car. Um, of course, there are no seat belts back then. If I was, if there were, I wouldn't put them on anyway, right? Two, two and a half years old. They run, they find out what ha- what's happening. They see the cars missing out. Oh my gosh. And my mom had just lost my my daughter, my sister Linda, too. She was a blue baby. She was going, oh my gosh, I lost another child. They ran down there and they found me all curled up on the seat. My mom thought I was dead. When they reached in. I didn't have a bruise or a scratch. And I swear there was a cat on the seat with me. My memory is that there was a cat. And I ran this by Dr. Crini. He said, oh yeah, we all have these little spirit guys. So anyway, that was a a side remark. I wanted to to bring up that we have these these beautiful experiences along the way. If, If we're meant to stay alive, the universe is going to find a way to keep us alive, right? And if it's time for us to go, it's time for us to go. So that's where we can let go of the fear of death. It's going to happen when it is supposed to. It's never going to be an accident. You might have an excuse. Oh, you fell off the cliff or whatever. That might be the excuse. But the timing is is something that has been like, programmed, if you will. So you can just let go of that fear of death. Now I forgot where we were, uh, I forgot the trail. So get me back on that trail. Oh, the serotonin. serotonin yeah. Yes. So um, the serotonin, yeah, I, w- I kept attracting uh, all these people. And then when I was told that I was going to c- continue to have uh, by this time, it was, you know, it was one-stop shopping with my husband. <laughs> because I got out of him what what I got from my dad from my mom my older sister she was set up as a as a, um, my enemy you know she wanted to be my friend uh, and look at the outside world there see what happens to us yeah but she wanted to be my friend but it was the control issue so anyway he was able to trigger me in all you know from all of these these memories and so I'm being taught I'm going through the divorce. So I go, okay, I decide to let go of that. But now I was still having all of the pain and the anguish and the fear. 
And um, I'm still working on non-fear. And this is when I was told that, yeah, my serotonin, I was getting my serotonin. How can I get rid of it? I, I finally made the decision. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. How come all this stuff keep happening? And um, it was because I had to keep producing. He says, so you need to find ways to pull back from that need. And that's when I decided that I would get excited whenever I saw a butterfly or a sunset. Now, people want proof. What about the serotonin thing? There's a really interesting experience I had. I was working with somebody who had one of these really <clears throat> advanced biofeedback machines. And the biofeedback uh, said that I was addicted to victim. And I went into, I was so upset. I go, oh my gosh, wouldn't, can I just be addicted to alcohol or something normal like that? <laughs> don't, they know what to do with that, don't they? But when you're addicted to victim, how do you, so that's how I kept bringing in experiences to make me a victim. And, uh, and so she said, hey, but if there's this button here where you can reverse that. Oh, okay, well, let's try this. Now it wasn't in her training. Um, so we were experimenting. And I almost lost my life because it turned out to be my core personality was victim. And so I stopped producing ferritonin and I could hardly lift my arm. So I check in with the healer and he says, well, you are lucky you didn't die because, but you're an old soul. So you got through it. But so that's my proof. When, when my core identity was reversed and of course it didn't stick because I wasn't ready for it. I didn't have the lesson. And so here I'm going to hound it in. When you get the lesson, things have the permission to disappear from your life. So I had to get the lesson to stand up for myself. I knew I needed to do that, but I had to, and it is so hard. It was excruciating to stand up for myself when I wasn't, when I was trained to do otherwise. And people who are brought up in <clears throat> more uh, sane families, uh, more healthy families where they teach the child to have a sense of self, they can't relate to that. And they can't relate to why would a woman go back to an abusive relationship? And it's like this magnetic thing. You, you, you don't have, you know, you see it, you, and you, but then your mind has to excuse it. Oh, well, he'll get better. And you know, that, so your mind will come in and make the excuses, but it's not your mind that's doing it. It's this it's just like this magnetic attractor that you need that to stay alive and be safe in an insane way. And in the case of a woman who's with an abuser, well, she sometimes she ends up getting killed, but she was safe in the sense that this is where she felt familiar. So we feel safe around that which is familiar. That's why we have xenophobia. You know, when you're in a room full of people who are not like you, you know, you, you don't feel if they're all dressed different or whatever, is because they're not familiar. Maybe there's nothing wrong with them. But that's part of our programming that we need to mindfully deconstruct so that we understand when something truly is a threat and it truly isn't a threat. But you can apply this to like refugees. People, you know, I have a daughter who lives in Sweden and they were bring, they've been bringing refugees up there for quite some time. And the people there would complain. They go, well, wait a minute, these, these refugees, they don't, they're bringing refugees from the Middle East where they're going through tons of trauma, bombs, you name it, you know. Um, and they bring them up to Sweden where, I don't know if you've ever been to Sweden, but there ain't much going on there. You know, it's just like, oh, you know, 
everything's nice, you know, they're very even tempered, you know, they would never invite Tony Robbins there, believe me, <laughs> he's too out there for them. <laughs> so, but they don't understand when they bring these refugees and they go, well, wait a minute, they're in this safe place and they're going bananas. It's because, well, you, you took away too much of their trauma too fast without training their nervous system to adapt to this new form of safety. And so I was just pulling my when I was seeing and people hearing people on the new, you know, talking about, you know, complaining about them, how they were ungrateful or they're just, you know, impossible or whatever. But some of them, you know, did adapt, but it was a big, it's a big problem. And it's a big problem around the world because we have lots of refugees. And so, and then they end up being, uh, a lot of them will end up being um, mugged. They're the ones who are getting mugged and so forth. It's not because they're bad or they deserve it. It's because they still have this energy pattern of trauma. So as a species, we need to recognize cycles of trauma and stop the cycle of trauma and heal the people. And we don't discount anybody's story, no matter how wild, because when you invalidate somebody, that's what happened to me. I went to the, the psychiatrist. I just did that because I was in the divorce. You can only go to the people who are um, certified by the court, right? You know, as bona fide, uh, what do they call it, experts. And of course, I went to him and and because I needed I needed something for my nerves. And um, he said, well, point blank, he says, I was taught that that's a fantasy. There's no such thing as satanic ritual abuse and that it's all in your imagination. He told me point blank. And he was a very good soul, a very good hearted person, but he believed his training. So this is where we've got to do the education. And also, you know, like when I meet a schizophrenic, now, I don't believe the story that they're telling me that all these people are after them and all these wild things are happening. But I, I take it in as if, okay, that's really real to them. And they need to feel safe by somebody just listening. The act of compassionate listening can be so healing. And so this gets to what I do in, in my practice. Um, it's this, it was explained to me by the, the, the term platicas, which is an Aztec term for heart to heart. And so the Aztec shaman understood that if somebody has been through a trauma and they've completely healed from it, then when somebody comes to them to simply talk to them and relate their experience, just by the act of communicating heart to heart, the wisdom of that healing transfers to that person. Because that's the way we're designed. How beautiful is that? So that's why I got so excited that I go, oh, I, I got clear, I go, I don't have any demons, no, 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 that stuff. I got, I was vetted <laughs> by more than one healer. I said, are you sure? Are you sure I'm not going to do anything crazy? I don't have any programming left or, you know, and, and also that I've forgiven and see what does it mean to forgive is that my goal, just like Eckhart Tolle explains, the goal wasn't to forgive. The goal was to heal. The forgiving comes as a natural byproduct because you're no longer placing blame on that person. I could see, I could heal first, like when I realized that my father had to go through horrendous things to do the horrendous things to me, because we don't do this. It, 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 you just don't find a human being who will do that naturally. Why do they have to train soldiers to kill? Because it's, it's not our instinct to kill, okay? So 
I had to go into that and go, and then, now this might be a little bit much for some people, but I, I do believe that we make soul contracts. And, um, and I did have a soul contract with my father to do this. Um, and he actually did a service because this was the excuse that got me to the healer so that I could go and retrieve all my soul pieces from past lives. And that I had worked with him in lives prior where we were, what do you call it? Uh, we were uh, supports for each other. This time he had to play this role. Unfortunately, when we come into these roles, sometimes we forget well, most of the time we forget and we can get distracted by the role and we can go a little too far, whatever. And, um, but he did wake up when I was around 11, 12, and he realized what he was doing. And so he got both me and my brother out of the program and he knew it would mean his death. So, he died of cancer, uh, a very slow, long, slow death, which people will say that was a good way for him to release karma from what he did. Now, this is an interpretation. Not everybody has to buy into it, but it helps me feel more at peace. And I've communicated with him many times uh, since in my deepest healing. And I'm grateful to him because he, in my view, he made the greater sacrifice because his soul had to go through so much healing at the soul. After doing, when a soul performs these types of acts here, you don't just go back to your review board and they say, oh, bad job, you do it, you know. <laughs> oh, we think, you know, this might be, you know, no you have some things that really deeply need to be healed. And of course you're supported by angelic beings, uh, but it was, it's taken him a while. And I'm so grateful because now I understand that this was our agreement. Now, of course, to die. You told, if you told me this, when I first started that, I go, what? <laughs> But it took this evolution where I could see this. And I start, I read the book, uh, Sacred Contracts by Carolyn Miss. Also, if you read Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life. She talks about this. And so when we, we realize that we are more in command than we think we are, and then we can understand that we're truly not victims, and that we can, okay, I'm not a victim anymore. Okay, it just doesn't just reverse just by thinking that. You have to retrain, you know, and there's certain circumstances where I go like, okay, I'm an older person, right? The computer, sometimes <laughs> I have issues with the computer, <clears throat> my relationship with the computer. And that will set me off and I have to be careful because I'll affect it. So I go, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I can, you know, I don't want to blow up my computer. It's my friend. But sometimes, you know, getting on websites and trying to negotiate them. Uh, but we're, we're here for experiences. Uh, but how can we support the people who are going through these experiences right now? We can surround them. If you're not in the front lines, okay, we're not in the front lines. If you're not in the front lines, send everyone compassion. All those involved. For me to be, see, to be healed, I had to look down at my abuse and I had to look at myself as an equal with all the other players. And I had to send compassion and forgiveness because then I forget, I, I would uh, feel blame. You know, why did I allow this to happen? You know, these human selves, these ideas that we get, 
we get these really crazy, crazy notions and we beat ourselves up. And I became an expert at beating myself up. So I, I know, and it doesn't take severe trauma to do that. A hundred percent. That's so beautiful. And I love that you, you know, it's always controversial when I talk about not just forgiveness, but in looking at multiple different lenses, whenever we think about abusers, right? Because when you say I'm going to forgive somebody, or I'm trying to understand how that person got to where they are, people misinterpret that as we have empathy and excuse what they did, right? But that's the piece that's really missing for a lot of society that does know that this goes on is, and it's very justified, the, the emotions that stir up when people learn are, you know, anger and, you know, just being so mad and enraged and infuriated. And I think that's justified. But when we don't sit here and say, we need to have a better understanding of this, we need to understand how a perfect, innocent child that's born without hate, without any yeah. notion of abuse, what happens between then and when they do become abusive, right? And so mm -hmm. we're kind of at the point where we, we can understand what an innocent child looks like. We know what abuse looks like, but bridging that gap between what happens, that's where I think the compassion comes in is to realize, oh my gosh, what makes a person be so evil that it's beyond the comprehension of people who hear about it. You know, these are people that were inflicted with so much trauma, had no idea what love was. You know, that's not like you said, a natural thing for, you know, somebody to grow up and say, I'm just gonna perform horrific, you know, rituals on my children and, and prostitute them out, you know? And again, it doesn't excuse what people do, but I love that you're shedding light on that just because I do think that in healing as a society and in being there for survivors, survivors are always the ones I've never had a survivor on my show who was like, I freaking hope that, that all my abusers die and that they die these horrific deaths. You know, they're like, I hope justice comes. I want to get justice, but you know, that was my dad or that was my, somebody in my life that I love. <laughs> That's somebody that I wish would heal. I wish they would come to the side that I'm on, you know, and I wish I could understand or pull them out of that. And so I really appreciate you talking about that just because I think that's really hard for people who haven't gone through that and who have never traversed such a deep level of healing to understand the layers of how to come out on the other side and to be able to look at the world in a with a lens that is with compassion and love and empathy and to have that be the frequency that you want to remain on instead of continuing to dip into these anger and fear patterns, you know, because like how you said that stores in our body, you know, it manifests, even if it's not trauma that we took on, if it's a reaction of something we're continuously reacting to, that's, I mean, mm -hmm. they want that, you know, abusers want us in a low vibration. And even if that means that we're angry at them, that's narcissists get off on, you know, us having a negative reaction to what they do. So it's like our fear and anger reactions feed what they want. It makes them more powerful. Like we're connecting those emotions to them, you know? And, and I really appreciate that you kind of talk about, Hey, we need to, we need to cut that cord. You know, we need to focus on how do I become the best version of me? How do I raise my frequency and not have these attachments to people other than trying to understand while remaining in a place of healing and, you know, higher frequency myself. Well, that this is what Jesus came to teach. Yes. When he was, okay, if you're, you have a problem with forgiveness, then what about when he's on the cross in the middle of being tortured and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He knew how to hold compassion even while abuse was being perpetrated upon him in the moment. So I thought, okay, I learned how to forgive something in the past. Now my goal is to be able to forgive in the moment, the way it's portrayed in this beautiful story. And that, and we, we focus on all the trauma and, you know, the nails and we get all, we get all um, distracted 
by the story and you go, well, wait a minute, you forgot the whole point. The whole point, look at what he's doing, this most beautiful thing he's saying at this time. And we're not talking about that part of the story, that that is the big part of the story. And it's compassion. You know what compassion is? And I love, I got this definition from Anthony William. Compassion is love that understands suffering. Oh. Yes. That's so the world needs that. compassion. So if a person sees a terrible thing and they're feeling like, oh, I'm so angry or they want revenge, whatever, if they could at least, but they're sending, actually it's, it's eating themselves, right? So when we, anybody that we destroy, it's actually affecting anybody else. So when you're imploding on yourself, you're doing a disservice to humankind. So you're not, you're not separate from everybody. So be good to yourself, be kind to yourself and go, okay, I went through this anger, I've got this, I'm going to process it. How can I transmute it to at least a place of neutrality so that I'm not feeding the flame, okay? And um, we can still talk about these things. There are, to be able to talk about things without getting overly emotional. We get overly emotional when we still have unhealed pieces. When I listened, so one of the things I wanted to do to vet myself to see, okay, can I really help people? Is I watched uh, several of the trials of the ITNJ. Have you heard of them? No, I don't think so. The International Tribunal of Natural Justice. And they interviewed uh, the gal from Australia. Wow. I forgot her name, but I saw her name listed on your website. Um, so they interviewed, it's, a, it's an international tribunal. Now the people, these SRA survivors, MK Ultra, um, the survivor and the people from the other side who came to this side, came in with their documentation and said, this is what, ha I have the documentation, the police records, this, 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 this. So I could, lit, and they would go explicitly into the tortures and what happened to them. And I found that I was able to hold compassion around that. And I didn't go into reaction. So that was my test for myself. I'm going, okay, I did heal that. I did heal that. And even if I don't do anything further with that healing, because I'm connected to everybody, that's helping everybody in some way. So we all can be of service just by, as Michael Jackson said, you know, look at the man in the mirror, take care of the man, the woman in the mirror, take care of that person in the mirror, give that person compassion, give the for in order to get to forgiveness. Now, this was the hard part of the path forgiving the self. That's why I like the Ho'oponopono prayer because it's very general and um, it's like you're talking from both sides when you're saying the Ho'oponopono prayer. I am sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. This is from the Hawaiian tradition. And it's just, and I sing it. It's, 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 and oh my gosh, I'm going to tears. And, all, and I had to do a lot of healing around my father. And with all the over, this is the other thing I want to pass on that was very fascinating to me in my healing. With all the over the top stuff my dad did, of course, my mom was just kind of like a, she was there. She had her hands tied. If she said anything, she'd get thrown in the loony bin. She couldn't, you know, yeah. he threatened to, to put her away. So and your so, mom, your mom wasn't involved. She was being abused also. Yes. And she was 15 years younger. So she was like one of the kids. Oh. I mean, she was, so she was in that category, but my mother rejected me because, um, she got married to my father because she got pregnant with me. 
So she blamed me for all of her problems. So from the very get-go, she rejected me. In my healing, the deepest hurt was being rejected by my mother. It wasn't the satanic rituals. It wasn't the prostitution. It wasn't being abused physically and sexually by my father. It was being rejected by my mother, hurt me more deeply. So folks, take that one and understand the power of the mother. And if you don't love your child, please allow somebody else to love that child. So um, that was, I, I just, I was flabbergasted. You know, this took years of, of healing, but that was really hard. That was really hard. And it's so understandable. You know, that's something if people just had a great relationship with their mother, you know, you don't realize like, you know, one of my guests that I had on John Paul Rice, he talks about children, babies, the, the mother and the father, those are like God to the child. You know, the child doesn't, that's their whole, they eat, breathe, live their parents. They're dependent on them. That's the only things that the child knows and depends on every day are the parents and the mother, you know, that connection. And when you don't have that, the different side effects that end up unconsciously, you know, building forming, and being created in that, in that child's young, impressionable, mind you know it's that's another thing I don't think as a society we we've gotten away from that you know there obviously is an agenda to break up the family unit which has been very successful in a lot of ways but then there's also you know women empowerment which is so great but at the same token it it's putting pressure on women to say you're worthless if you are at home being a mom you need to be out working and be you know a badass woman and, you know, a boss babe. And, mm -hmm. you know, not, again, not that I have anything against women who work, but that, that young baby and that young child just needing that, I don't think people realize, you know, the extent of damage it does when that mother's not there for the child. And so I appreciate you talking about that a little bit. Yes. And there's something energetic called the mother cord that doesn't exist. There's no father cord. The child, it's, it's like an, uh, an energetic umbilical cord that the, and, and on the more on the psychological level, we say that the child needs attachment, you know, a, that's the good form of attachment. We're talking, you know, in the religious, you know, the um, spiritual sense, we don't want to be attached, right? But we're talking in the psychological um form with uh, uh, children is that the small child attaches and so this is an abuse that just is absolutely awful is corporate daycare. I had, I, I ended up working in corporate daycare a few years ago and I'm going, why spirit, why did you send me here? And I, I, I go, oh my gosh, I felt like I was at the other end of the abuse here. I'm with the clipboard. And what they did is they had it. I was in the infant room and I can't remember if we had 10 or 12 uh, babies uh, for two adults. Every two hours, we had to change the diaper. Every two for each child. Every two hours, we had to feed each child, and we had to record all of this on two on a piece of paper and also on a tablet and send the information to the parents so the parents knew in time, real time, your child just pooped, and this is how much they put. So. We had no time to hold the babies. Aww. They're crying. I thought the first three days, I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose it. I'm going to cry. I mean, oh, my God. I feel like an abuser. And everybody think, nobody thinks anything is wrong with this. And I'm going, so we have to open our eyes where we go, wait a minute. We really have to understand what it really means to be in a human body, I do believe that we're spirits that live in human bodies, but when we're in this body, we need to respect what I call are the, is the setup. And the setup is this bonding that happens with the child and it's specifically with them. Now the father is important, but the mother is like, if the mother rejects the child, it is 
it, it runs deeper. And uh, so I, I thought that is something that people really, really need to know. And we need to support motherhood. Yes. We need to support it and that women don't have to go out there and work. they make great managers. Uh, this is the time of the divine feminine energy is rising, but we need balance. We need, we need the divine masculine as well as the divine feminine. And this is what comes together. And this is where we have the father, the mother, and the child, the first, the, the first trinity, the father, mother, child. And um, if we don't solve that triangle, so the spiritual, okay, to, let me talk about the spiritual path directly, that if a person wants to heal from this abuse, they have to be on the spiritual path. There, there's no... Now, it doesn't matter what religion you're, okay? I'm not telling you have to be this religion or that religion. Spiritual meaning you're connected to the source, to God, whatever you want to call it, but something bigger than yourself. And understand that you are more than, you extend way beyond the limits of your skin. And people are telepathic. It just, you know, it's, uh, I can just keep talking and talking. I am so sorry. We're going on a bit over time here. So we, yes, no, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you. And I would love to have you on again. I feel like we just kind of scratched the surface on some things. And I know like how I told you before we started recording, you're somebody I could have on 500 times and always have something to talk about. So I appreciate you. I think this was a great you know, way for people to get to know you who maybe haven't heard your story yet. And I, I mean, I've learned a lot from listening to the other interview that you sent me and then just how you word things. I think you take really hard concepts and break them down in, in ways that people can digest and understand, you know, and I love that you're out there talking about a lot of this because not many people are and, and hopefully that'll change. I know more and more people are out there talking about it, you know, but it starts with people like you that are willing to be first and to pave the way, even if for years and years and years, just like with Kathy O'Brien, like I can't imagine coming out and talking when, when she started or even what, you know, when, when you did, or some of these other amazing women who started talking way before, you know, these last few years when people like me have woken up to it, you know? So I just, I honor you for everything that you've done. Cause I can't, I can't fathom what you've been through. And I'm so sorry for everything you've been through. And I'm so inspired by what you've done with it. You know, you've done more with your life and understand more in your life than most people who haven't gone through trauma, you know? And I just think as a world, we have so much to learn from all of you on what we're capable of and healing and these really complex things that happen as a result from trauma and abuse. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that, that you came on and, and shared space with me today. And I'd love for you to, if you want to just talk for just a minute about positive shifting where people can find you and connect with you with that. And we can obviously bring you on again and talk more in depth about it. But I think that's really special that, that you know, you're doing this work and I'd love to share it with people. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, um, it's positiveshifting.com. Uh, I do spiritual coaching. Um, and basically um, the vast majority of people come to me have no idea what my background is. They just know that I have a trauma background I don't go into detail uh, because it's it's still not very relatable, and um, and I didn't want to make that my identity either. It's something that happened to me. It's like you know, do you say that since you went to this gym and now you're a bodybuilder, you know, forever? You know, you went. I went to the gym and I worked out. You know, I'm not a bodybuilder. So um, and and I just. It's for people who are serious about becoming what they were meant to be, you know, uncovering that diamond. I believe that everybody's like got this diamond uh, inside that's shining, uh, but we can't see it because it's just been, you know, layered over with experiences and we've layered it over with the, with beliefs and things that hold us back. So um, it just is so liberating to watch people uh, get those aha moments to know, oh, this is who I really am. 
and to, but basically I have to honor where they are at and I meet people where they're at. And, um, and some people are just wanting to just do better uh, at their job and they want to progress spiritually uh, that way uh, because 70% of the spiritual path is emotional processing. So people who are into self-help and learning about themselves are on the spiritual path and they really, well, actually we all are on the spiritual path, you know, whether we declare it or not, but um, the people who are mindfully on the spiritual path um, is just, most of it is because our connection, our interpreting devices, our emotions, we we know what's going on through our emotions. Those are what give us cues. And if we didn't have emotions, then we wouldn't, this is the way we're set up as human beings, right? And we have very intense emotions. So we have to learn how, um, how to use them as tools for our benefit instead of becoming victims of our emotions. So it's all about reframing. I like to reframe things. So when somebody comes in, I watch their speech pattern and then I'll go, oh, I see the theme. Do you see the theme? And then we pick up the theme. It's not about the details. We get caught in the details, just like Jesus on the cross. We go, oh my God, the cross, the, the thorns, the blood. The, wait a minute, what did he say? What did he say that was so profound? You guys, that was it. He came there with this beautiful message. So um, I want to end with that, that, you know, um, like to send everybody compassion and I invite everybody to uh, move into their compassion for all the beings uh, that exist here. So that's just beautiful. And are you on social media at all? Or is your website the best place for people to find you? The website is the best place. Um, I'm not really good at social media. I started doing Instagram, but on Instagram, I just post all of mostly uh, my healthy food. I kind of like, uh, we didn't talk about the um, uh, personality uh, disorder thing, but it's just kind of fun for me that, okay, now I have this personality on Instagram and it's all, but it's all about helping people. And I am going to, I'm trying to figure out how to put things out in snippets so that um, it's digestible for the average person, not just for, you know, I get to speak openly about SRA because of you, but I don't do that uh, I'm still sorting out how to, to do things without getting put in a niche. So I'm, I want to reach as many people as possible to tell them that, you know, no matter who you are, no matter what your, your background, no matter what your journey is, healing is possible and joy is possible and the rubber band effect is true. I've talked about that in the past, but I got to experience it. And you've heard about the rubber band effect, right? And so for listeners, you know, the, the farther back in darkness you go, when you let go of the rubber band, the further you get. So in, in November, I was dealing with excess joy. <laughs> How and beautiful. I was, so, <laughs> I was so ungrounded for a few weeks ago. Well, okay, this is like anxiety because I still can't. <laughs> I can't type, but it's really cool. <laughs> that's an imbalance. And I went to my naturopath. She said, well, I think that's a good problem to have. Everybody else has been coming in with depression. So, <laughs> so there, it's like it, it, these experiences clean you out. They scour you out. And if you can appreciate that and appreciate your new vessel, if you will, then you can go and, and help other people and spread the joy and, um, and the hope. Well, I'm so grateful for you. You're such a beautiful soul and your heart just radiates so brightly and, and so does everything about you. And I'm so grateful that you chose to come on here today. 
And for people listening, I will link her website. And then if she's able to give me her Instagram handle, do you have a handle? Are people able to follow you on Instagram? Or is that more of like your personal page kind of? No, I, I made it public, but it, you know, it's not going to be real exciting stuff. It's going to be just fun little things. So that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll have to figure out how to do, like me and technology. <laughs> Oh, it's always a work in progress. There's so much. And then once you learn it, they add new features and do new stuff. It's just, you know, yeah. never yeah. end. So I'll link all of her information below in the show notes. Please, everybody continue to say prayers for Kaylin as she continues to sort out how to best present this information to the public and then speak out on platforms like this. I think everybody that, that listens knows that spiritual attacks are real and there's a lot of opposition that doesn't want people like Kaylin to have a voice and to be able to, to share this information. So people like, like you and me can learn. So continue to pray for her, go support her business, follow her on social media, reach out to her, contact her on her website, hire her and just shower her with love and in compassion and take everything that she learned and spread that love and compassion with everybody that you come in contact with that that I think is the best way that you can honor Kaylin and the legacy that that she's creating and going to leave behind so thank you all for listening God bless you and we will see you all next week